We're starting a little late. We've had some uh, shifting, uh, which is to be expected, and thank you all for bearing with us. Um, I want to welcome you all to the University of Texas at Tyler's uh, second annual Art History Symposium. I'm Joe Beth Cox, or Joe. Um, I'm the History of Art Undergraduate Society, or House, uh, the House Secretary. Um, and to make myself a little less nervous, I wanted to open with a joke. <laughs> There's the joke. <laughs> Let it marinate. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know what a symposium is, it's um, an ancient Greek drinking party. Um, it was BYOB, so I hope you guys hear that. No, it was, um, I mean it was, but it was also for, you know, the exchange of ideas. And that's what we essentially are going to be doing today. Um, or the part that we're going to recognize today at least. Uh, our symposium is made possible by the Department of Art and Art History here at UT, um, the History of Art Undergraduate Society House, UT Tyler Student Life and Leadership, and also um, the institutions that are sending us their amazing gifted speakers and all of our visiting speakers today. Uh, those schools represented today are Baylor, TCU, there we are, UNT, University of Dallas, and Texas Tech. So we're so happy that you um, are here and will be speaking for us today. Uh, they're going to be covering subjects like surrealist photography, pop art, uh, animation, new media. Um, I was actually talking last night with one of our speakers about how art history is so investigative. Um, and really, it's just about filling in gaps in history, right? Just finding these ideas or these, um, these holes, I guess, in, in information, and then filling in those holes with information. Um, and that's what our speakers are going to be doing today. We have uh, scorecards that proved to be very helpful tools because mine last year had Stop Looking Down written on all of them, like many, many times. And I'm making eye contact. So, yay. So they are helpful. Um, and the idea is also that the highest scored speaker at the end is going to get a nice prize. Um, it's an art history book, and it's hardcover, and it weighs like 300 pounds. So you know it's good. Um, I want to thank our judges. We've got Derek Frazier, uh, Director of Interpretation at the Tyler Museum of Art. We also have um, Dr. Elizabeth Lasso, who is a professor of art history here at UT. And then we also have uh, Joanna Gifford, who is a graduate um, teaching assistant in the art department. Uh, thank you to our guest speaker, photographer Robert Langham. He will be speaking at the end. Uh, happy to have him here. Uh, thank you to all of our volunteers that are members of House. Um, thank you to the House Symposium Committee uh, and to Dr. Lasso, our faculty advisor. Um, just a few housekeeping and scheduling notes. The bathrooms are directly behind the auditorium, so if you exit out the back doors and then kind of make a U-turn, um, that's where you'll find the bathrooms. Uh, exits in the back and then over here to the side will take you out. Um, we're going to do a short bathroom break after the second speaker and then lunch is going to be at 12.15 following the fourth speaker. Uh, there will also be five to ten minutes of questions um, directly after each presentation. So, without further ado, please welcome Hannah Ziesman from TCU. She's going to be talking to us about uh, the Bruce High Quality Foundation. Soho studio, and it was nothing short of an extraordinary experience. 
Though the late social sculptor has long since passed, his aura still seems to fill the room. His Eames leather couch sits like a shrine in the middle of the space. A ring of liquid stains the top of his Noguchi coffee table. A shadow of Bruce's signature drink, brandy and benedictine in a water tumbler. It feels as if Bruce should still be sitting on his couch in his vinyl pants, sipping his drink, his head bursting with ideas. Despite Bruce's overwhelming success, his studio is nothing more than a white cube. On one wall hangs a silk screen, printed for and given to him by, pers personally by Andy Warhol. Oddly enough, the only other adornment is a crucifix between the two windows. Not many know that he was devoutly Catholic and attended Mass every Sunday. Though his devotion to God never once deterred his beautiful sense of humor, as pasted over the top of Christ's face is a small white circle with a child's drawing of a smiley face on the front. Bruce had a childlike sensibility at times. An adage explains that once during Bruce's regular stroll through Central Park, he stumbled upon a little girl sobbing. He asked why she was so distraught, and she replied that she had lost her favorite doll. Without skipping a beat, Bruce remedied the situation by inventing a story about the doll having gone on a trip. He explained to her that the doll had sent him a letter, which he was supposed to have brought to the little girl. However, he regretfully left it at home, but tomorrow he would bring it by for her to read. That evening, Bruce wrote a detailed letter explaining the doll's beautiful adventure and brought it back to the little girl the next day. He did this not just once, but every evening he wrote a letter that cataloged the journey of the doll to help the little girl cope with her loss. The downside of this heartwarming story is that Bruce High Quality is not a real person. The Bruce High Quality Foundation is actually a group of students from Cooper Union who entered the public sphere in 2005 when they replicated a Cristo and Jean-Claude Gate strapped it to a speedboat and chased after Robert Smithson's floating Central Park, created for the Smithson retrospective at the Whitney that same year. Though they claim the foundation was created in 2001, after the date, the death of the late social sculptor Bruce High Quality, and that the foundation is the official arbiter of his estate. The group refers to themselves as the Bruces, and they remain completely anonymous, wearing masks of Bruce High Quality when appearing in public foreign photos. Since the attention they gained in 2005, they've been featured in the 2010 Whitney Biennial, had numerous shows at the Susan Ingla Gallery in New York City, and have obtained representation by independent curator and art dealer Vito Schnabel. In addition, they have founded a free art school called the Bruce High Quality Foundation University, or BHQFU, and started their own Brucennial as an alternative to the Whitney Biennial. Bruce High Quality Foundation performs these works with the aim of critiquing the art world and its greater community, whilst simultaneously existing within it. They accomplish this by the use of a parafictional persona, Bruce High Quality, as well as the appropriation of art history, and eventually further their goal by creating alternatives. Bruce High Quality Foundation operates simultaneously as an individual artist, foundation, and artwork, all of which assist in cultivating a humorous public facade. Curators and critics have the privilege to either expose the collective's lies or continue cultivating the image of Bruce High Quality, the image the foundation has presented. Regardless of others revealing the truth behind Bruce, the foundation will maintain that he was a real person and that they are now working on his behalf. Bruce High Quality Foundation also believes that all dialogue generated by and around the collective becomes a part of their work. Therefore, everything written about Bruce High Quality Foundation has to be taken with a grain of salt making it incredibly difficult to determine the truth behind their artworks. Many of the publications written about Bruce High Quality Foundation are authored by members of the collective and are completely nonsensical. For example, their catalog for their retrospective entitled Bruce High Quality Foundation, Foundation and Other Ideas, contains a section of footnotes from the future, meaning all the publication dates are roughly 30 years senior than the publication itself. The same section also includes an extended bibliography containing a nondescript advertisement for the Sotheby's MasterCard with the tagline, Love John Mikel Basquiat, get the card that rewards your passion. They have also authored an exploratory version of their mission statement as expanded upon through a post-apocalyptic story of zombies attacking the Guggenheim. As mentioned previously, any additional authorship by outside sources becomes appropriated as part of their work and therefore, it is equally as difficult to view as fact. For example, the details about Bruce's favorite drink, his vinyl pants, and his stroll through Central Park are all cited pieces of information from sources other than the Foundation, which were public, published as fact by writers outside of the collective. I also add 
provided him personally fabric information about information about Bruce, such as his Eames couch and his Noguchi coffee table. Therefore, supplementing an image already presented with my own nonsensical image, which is now officially theirs. The writings and works of Bruce High Quality require something else to shall help shed light on their duplicity. Discussing Bruce High Quality in the vein of the parafictional assists in explaining an otherwise unexplainable swamp of misinformation. In Make Believe, Parafiction and Plausibility, author, author Carrie Lambert Beatty dissects the term parafiction and its relationship to contem contemporary art. Parafiction, in its simplest definition, places real and or imaginary personages and stories in with the real world. Parafictional works are fiction that are ex experienced as fact for a period by the viewer. The artworks often attempt to alter the worldview of the viewer and intervene on political or social issues. Essentially, the parafictional is a form of deception. However, this deception is often intended to inflict change or bring about awareness, a heroic deception. Lambert Beatty frames her argument primarily around a tribute to Safan Benar, an installation by Michael Bloom, Bloom for the Turkish Pavilion at the 2005 Venice Biennale. In his piece, Bloom cultivated the life story of Safan Benar, a female figure from an ethnic minority who addressed Turkish political and social issues. In some ways, the character was obviously cultivated. Bloom took great care to make certain her face could not be made out well in photographs, and that details like book covers with her name were obviously glued to the front of other texts. However, for most viewers, Stefan Bonaire became a real figure, so far so that some newspapers have credited her as being an important historical figure in the Turkish feminist movement. Lambert Beatty uses the parafiction in order to explain Bloom's work. She states that Bloom's project deceived tactically and for progressive purposes, and in a way that allows for the possibility of the deception's discovery. She explains that viewers of the work are caught in a gotcha moment, which allows for their worldview to be subtly altered by untruths. Lambert Beatty goes on to dissect several other contemporary works of art through the parafictional. The general theme of each piece ultimately being the altered worldview of the viewer, illuminating a social or political issue for the better. Lambert Beatty uses the analogy of a laboratory where artists wear white coats and viewers run through their mazes. This analogy is very helpful in understanding parafictional works of art. She also points out that often this tactic is humiliating to the viewer, who is essentially demoted to a, condition, to a conditioned lab rat. Humiliating is a fair assumption, as viewers who perhaps, who perhaps ask sincere questions about someone like Stefan Monaire or Bruce High Quality are left with seemingly nothing more than a punchline later. Even if there is greater social or political issues presented, the tricking of the viewer is often seen negatively. This is understandable, as the viewer is expecting one kind of experience as in, and is instead forced into another. As viewers in these situations, we must dignify our position as lab rats. We do this by asking questions and receiving answers, however true or false they may be. Without this line of questioning, artists such as Bloom and Bruce High Quality Foundation are often labeled as pranksters, and the viewer moves on. Articles like Lambert Babies offer insight into works of these artists and assist in illuminating their work with a less negative light. Bruce High Quality Foundation requires the scholarship, precedent set by other artists such as Bloom, and this line of questioning from the viewer in order to be taken at least somewhat seriously in the art world. Bruce High Quality's artwork does not contain certainties. Instead, it is an experiment, and all statements made by or about the artist should be questioned. Facts are important, but not all the time. Distinguishing fact from fiction becomes more important in Bruce High Quality's works than the facts themselves. Unveiling the work's fiction does not destroy the work, but rather illuminates to the viewer those aspects worth changing within society. All this being said, Bruce High Quality Foundation is still largely, at its most basic level, a prankster put down of the art establishment. Their first piece was, after all, a little saffron gate strapped to a speeding zoom, speeding, speeding speedboat after Robert Smithson's floating island. Bruce High Quality Foundation constructed their gate in order to poke fun at the Whitney, where Smithson's retrospective was on display. Their target was Smithson because he is often idolized as the father of earthworks in, in the contemporary art world. A cult was created around Smithson's image, not unlike the fabricated image of Bruce High Quality, and Smithson's was also mostly false, created and elaborated by the press and the public. The replica of the little Cristo and Jean-Claude Bay 
another artist duo with a cult-like following. Chasing after the fabricated island is a hilarious little prank, but it also illuminates how broken the art world is, full of stories we have created about around these celebrity-like artists. In 2007, Bruce High Quality Foundation stepped further back in time into modern art, recreating Picasso's iconic Le Demoiselle de Avignon. Picasso's piece depicts five nude female figures posed wearing African masks. Bruce High Quality Foundation renamed their piece The Bachelors of Avignon. Their version is a collaged photograph of nude males, some wearing paper mache masks of Bruce High Quality's cartoon like face, others covered with a strange collage reminiscent of Cubism. Here, the collective is both resurrecting its art historical past and destroying it at the same time. As the independent art critic and curator Beatrice Gross states, it is between a reconstructivist archaeology and a deconstructive parody of art history. This duality of death and resurrection is seen throughout their work. Bruce High Quality Foundation is constantly struggling between killing the art world beast as well as surviving within it. In their exhibition catalog, the Bruce High Quality Foundation, Foundation and Other Ideas, which accompanied their retrospective at the Susan Inglet Gallery in 2008, Bruce High Quality Foundation inserted an essay by independent writer Nicholas Weist, which was intended to expand upon their artistic choices in the making of The Bachelors of Avignon. A condensed philosophy of the use of the mask in The Bachelors of Avignon, as it was titled, ultimately points out that the art world is constructed from stories told or fabricated about artists. Weiss draws a circle through modern art beginning in 1907 with Picasso's Demoiselle de Avignon. His disjointed paragraphs describe little antidotes about several well-known modern art artists and art historians. Picasso, a philandering sex addict, arrested for the 1911 theft of the Mona Lisa. Barnett Newman, who ran for mayor of New York City on the anarchist ticket and failed horribly in the resounding polls. Clement Greenberg, a notorious drunk who screamed at David Hockney at a party one evening. Weiss' cataloging of these stories goes on, ultimately ending by pointing out that in Picasso's Demoiselle de Avignon, it was written that Picasso depicted the prostitutes with masks because he felt they needed protection from venereal disease running rampant through Paris, and that he drew these masks from the trocadoro. However, Weiss states that it was later discovered that the masks were instead influenced by a small selection of Iberian masks sold to Picasso by a grifter who had stolen them from the Louvre. While the, art, while the art world figures presented by Weist are talented, he shows that these grand narratives and personas are a large part of why we hold so tightly to the figures themselves. The stories or masks about each artist is ultimately what makes them so interesting to the public. In the same exhibition catalog, Bruce High Quality Foundation first presents their official mission statement in three parts, entitled Short Version, Medium Version, and Long Version, A Day in the Life. The short version is simply, the Bruce High Quality Foundation was created to foster an alternative to everything. The medium version is as follows. The Bruce High Quality Foundation, the official arbiter of the estate of Bruce High Quality, is dedicated to the preservation of the legacy of the late social sculptor, Bruce High Quality. In the spirit and life and work of Bruce High Quality, we aspire to invest the experience of public space with wonder, to resurrect art history from the bowels of despair, and to impregnate the institutions of art with the joys of fans desirings, professional challenges, amateur solutions. While the medium version could itself be dissected, I believe the final version of the statement, a long version, a day in the life, to be a more appropriate depiction of the collective's persona. The final version is an exploratory version of medium version, where between each clause is an interjection of a post-apocalyptic story of zombies attacking the Guggenheim. Bruce High Quality Foundation begins their saga in the Guggenheim with a ragtag group of art world people, a bunch of art blogger, bloggers wearing Patagonia vests. They're very specific about the type of vest. Guggenheim staff and curators and art critics from the Village Voice who have gone to hide in the cafe by themselves because they think Bruce High Quality sent the zombies to kill them. The foundation must use whatever they can find in the museum to protect themselves and everyone else from the zombies. So they begin to construct zombie traps out of artworks. Francis Bacon paintings are positioned to distract the zombies. And Ava Hess's sculpture is draped as a net over the atrium. Dwayne Hanson's sculptures are used as decoys. And they roll brancusi heads down the spiral of the museum as a means of knocking over the zombies. When that fails, the zombies are, and the zombies are still attacking, they grab ammunition from the gift shop. 
mugs, tote bags, overpriced giant artwork, books, slinkies, and head to the vault of the museum where several Richard Prince matte black barracudas are waiting for them. They ran their way out of the museum and escaped with a ball of fire shooting out of the skylight behind them. It's hard to know where to go from a story like this. Is it just a funny little interjection? Alternatively, perhaps there's something to be taken from it. What I find so interesting is that the majority of the story is found wedged between two sections of the Armenian version of mission statement. To resurrect our history from the bowels of despair and to impregnate the institutions of art. This story is ridiculous. There's just no better, better way to put it. However, therein lies the resurrection. If one were in a life or death situation, an art museum is probably one of the last places anyone would want to be. It is hardly a hotbed of ammunition. Bruce High Quality Foundation, though, shows the museum is just that, ammunition. Thinking about these works of art as useful objects, weapons, nets, tactical advantages is in some ways ridiculous, but it is also a amusing way to reconsider the role of art in the museum, the untouchable and unattainable world brought down to its most intimate level and used for permission. This is where destroying and resurrecting the art world comes into play again. Destroying the unattainable Guggenheim, resurrecting it with a fantastical story, and impregnating new ideas about what art should be and where art should be into society. It takes a lot of gumption to place a story about zombies in the catalog for your retrospective at a well-respected New York City art gallery, or recreate Le Demoiselle de Avignon, one of the most recognizable pieces of modern art, or chase after an island in a speedboat for the sake of contemporary art. These works jab at the institutions of, modern, of the modern and contemporary art world, the museums, and their base in the art historical. While I feel the Foundation's hilarious nonsense has been pro proven to be intelligent work, it's worth pointing out that Bruce High Quality Foundation does have its moments of seriousness as well. Their piece for the 2010 Whitney Biennial was a more serious side of the Foundation. Entitled, We Like America and America Likes Us, it references a Joseph Boy's 1972 performance, I Like America and America Likes Me. Bruce High Quality Foundation created a portable museum by placing a Cadillac Miller Meteor in the center of the gallery space with a video projected on its windshield. In Boy's aforementioned piece, I Like America and America Likes Me, a car of this make was used for his transportation to and from the gallery in which he would spend three days with a coyote. The same car was also found often in Andy Warhol's Death and Disaster series. Cadillac Miller Meteors were originally designed to function as both an ambulance and a hearse. The car and this installation symbolize the difference between death and resurrection, or reviving and putting to rest American culturalness. The video projected on its windshield is another beast entirely. Beginning with footage of Joseph Boyd's being loaded into the Cadillac for transport, it continues for 22 minutes and contains hundreds of clips from, Amer from Americana. Ghostbusters, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, President Barack Obama dancing on the Ellen DeGeneres show, Tiger Woods playing golf, September 11th news footage, the Kent State anti-Vietnam war protests, and the moon landing are just a few of the recognizable images presented to the viewer. The voiceover on the video describes a strange relationship with America, as if it is a disgruntled step-parent or perhaps an abusive lover. In this installation at the Whitney, Bruce High Quality Foundation is grappling with the American myth as well as the role of institutions in defining American art. 